thank, thank you all of you for coming, especially those of you who are on the last bus. I was on the first bus, so I don't know who those of you were. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the, the organizers of this session uh, and the entire conference. It's been an amazingly interesting and well-run conference. Having run a conference myself about this size, I know how hard it is to get all the details right, and it's been really impressive. And, um, and I've learned a lot. Uh, and I not only had a nice time, but I've really learned quite a lot. And that's because, as many of the other speakers have, uh, plenary speakers have mentioned, I'm, I also am not a barcoder. I don't generate DNA data. I don't analyze DNA data. But ever since my thesis, which turned out to be about more species than I had originally thought it was, I've worked carefully with people who do that kind of work, like all of you, um, starting in the days when uh, DNA barcoding was actually protein electrophoresis, and then mitochondrial DNA without the benefits of PCR, and now here we are today with next generation sequencing. So it's, it's really amazing to see how much progress we've made and see how much the barcoding community itself has evolved over the years. It's quite impressive. So let me get to the heart of this talk, um, which is on this uh, slide, which is about the how many species live in the ocean and what we know about how many species live in the ocean. This slide is arranged chronologically. Uh, on the far left column, you see the uh, estimates for how many species live in the ocean based on habitat. Most of them are for coral reefs because there have been quite a few estimates for coral reefs. Coral reefs are thought based on the few groups where we have an actually pretty good understanding of how many things live in the ocean, namely fish. Um, fish, about 31% of all marine fish species live associated with coral reefs. So on that basis, you can sort of toggle back and forth between estimates for coral reefs and estimates for the ocean as large. And there are, there are a couple of things that you can see from this uh, graph. One is that the, in general, the estimates have been going down. Uh, contrary to the, the assessment that we might have 100 million species on the planet, which I think would be wonderful. Um, in general, through time, we started off with a very famous deep sea estimate of about 10 million species and, uh, in the deep sea, and also uh, Marjorie Eka, uh, about 10, perhaps as many as 10 million species on coral reefs. But over time, those estimates have gone smaller and smaller. So now, now estimates for coral reefs, for example, run around about a million species. Uh, which would imply about uh, 2 million species uh, in the, uh, in the 2.5 million species in the ocean at large. And the other thing that's interesting about this is that almost none of these estimates are based on actual collection of new data. They're um, based on extrapolations of area, uh, in the case of Marjorie Eka from the area of tropical forests, using those estimates to calculate coral reefs, and then recently statistical analyses uh, of ratios of different taxonomic levels, and simply uh, going around and asking uh, systematists how many, how many organisms uh, they think are in the groups that they study. So there's very little actual new data being collected to address this question. And so, and so why is it so hard? This, this slide um, captures uh, some of the results of uh, uh, Philippe Boucher, uh, one of the few people who actually does go around the planet and try to figure out what, what's living in the ocean. And, uh, and his data clearly illustrate why, why it's so difficult to get a handle on this question for the ocean. And, and in addition to the fact that, of course, the ocean is huge, it's 71% of the total surface area, about 95% of the habitable real estate, a lot of it pretty hard to get to. As on land, most marine species are small and uh, rare. And so you see here, um, this is a distribute, size distribution for gastropods, and about one third of them are less than uh, 4.2 millimeters. And then in this uh, rank abundance curve, you can see large, despite a very extensive sampling effort, large numbers of species that were collected just once or twice. And uh, as been, has been mentioned before, it's other estimates suggest that perhaps as many as 90, over 90% 90 of marine species have never even been named. So the huge size of the ocean, the fact that the organisms themselves are hard to census, and the fact that most of them don't have names has made it challenging. Of course, the not having names is why DNA barcoding uh, is so important in this context. And so as a result, most of the global analyses of diversity in the ocean actually use, use just a, tap into just a tiny fraction of the actual diversity in making those estimates. This is a graph showing uh, the diversity of organisms on uh, coral reefs uh, 
uh, published in 2002 by Callum Roberts, quite an influential paper. And you can see that red hotspot sitting over the coral triangle. Uh, but what's, what's really important to notice as well is the tiny fraction of organisms that were used to make these calculations, some fish, most of the corals, some snails and lobsters, all told a little over 3,000 species, despite the fact that a quarter, of, a quarter of a million species in Notion actually do have names. So it's based on a tiny, tiny fraction of, of what has been described, much less what might be out there. And so it was in this context that uh, in the census of marine life, uh, Paul Snellgrove, Snellgrove told you a little bit about that on, on Wednesday night. I was part of a group to try to figure out how many species live on coral reefs. And the, the Coral Reef Project started in 2005. So we had five years, and obviously we weren't going to census one-third of everything that lives in the ocean in five years. So what we decided to do was focus on developing the methods that could be carried forward to keep, the, to keep working on this problem. And in that context, we, we had two basic uh, components of the approach. One, of course, was DNA. We forgot entirely about names and, and, and identified everything by uh, DNA sequences. And the other was to use standardized sampling. So, uh, so here you see two of the uh, types of samples that we used. One are just dead heads of corals, but collected in a way that are standardized volumetrically. And the other are these uh, artificial settlement structures uh, autonomous reef monitoring structures, or arms as we call them. They consist of a series of PVC plates with spaces between them so things can grow on the plates and crawl in between in, in plates and hide there. You can think of them sort of as malaise traps for the ocean, those of you who do insect stuff. And, and so combining the DNA and the, and the standardized sampling allows you to uh, compare results from a wide variety of places. It sort of automates the process because you're not trying to get a name and send, send all the specimens out to experts, which can take a lot of time. And those two things together, the standardization and the, autom uh, the automation of the process, give you the potential to really scale up and, do a, and, and launch a worldwide sampling program. And so the, I'm going to, whoa. Uh, I'm going to. Um, talk about three projects um, in, the, in the course of the rest of this talk, just briefly give you a sense of what we've discovered both during the census and following the census. So the first one was looking at uh, using traditional barcoding methods to, uh, under, to census crustaceans, living mostly in deadheads, a little bit in those uh, artificial substrates. And this was work done by Leticia Plaisance, who you see here taking organisms out of a deadhead of coral. And this is the, these are the kind of results we got. And uh, the, basic, the bottom line here, and I'm sure many of you have curves like this in your own work, is that you, know, you sample and sample and sample, and still the curves show no sign of leveling off. And you can see how diverse the coral triangle is, that area highlighted, highlighted in the earlier slide uh, in this project, in this part, in this analysis as well. Uh, but to put it in another sort of simple graphic way, we, in the course of that census project, we sampled about 6.3 meters squared of reef area, so obviously a tiny, tiny fraction of all of uh, coral reefs. Uh, and we, but in doing so, if you look just at the brachyurian crabs, which are a pretty well-known group, the number of brachyurian crabs in 6.3 meters squared of coral reef is equivalent to about 80% of all the brachyurian crabs in Europe. So it gives you a sense of just how big the problem is, just for coral reefs, much less the deep sea, which has its own challenges. And so, so the, the bottom line uh, for this, this part of the, sort of the, this part of the evolution of the project was that although bar, barcoding works really, really well for the, what I like to call the charismatic microfauna, I think they're just as cute as rosemary spiders, by the way, I don't know if rosemary is here, but, uh, but, the, but the problem, the, but it takes a long time to actually sam sample them, even though it, it works pretty well. But what about all the other stuff that we're collecting? Now, these are plates from these autonomous reef monitoring structures. Uh, these were collected, left in, uh, on a coral reef in Indonesia for a year and pulled up, photographed by uh, a National Geographic photographer. They're beautiful. They could actually hang in a modern art museum. But in, for the purposes of, of this, uh, those of you who are thinking about diversity, the thing to think about when you look at these plates is how hard they would be to actually census in a traditional barcoding context. You, the harder you look at those things, 
the more things there are. So where do you stop sampling? I mean, you know, and first of all, and is this the same as this, and then this, and this? I mean, they're just, they're on any single plate, and there are 10 of these per arms, and each have two sides. You know, just a huge, huge number of tacks that makes it really, really hard to sample in anything like a time, time efficient way. And then there's also the really small stuff, or the medium small stuff, the st stuff that Mark, as Mark Blackster so, uh, uh, forcefully pointed out, you know, the stuff less than two millimeters is where the diversity is, and uh, that's true in the ocean as well, and this, this kind of thing is obviously really hard to do with traditional barcoding as well. And so, from the very beginning, we had this dream of going from barcoding to metabarcoding, and taking something like the contents of that jar, which is what you get when you actually process the samples from those reefs, uh, uh, artificial surfaces, taking those, extracting the DNA, and using next-gen sequencing to get metabarcodes and, and lists of, of species. And I have to say, um, this is a lot easier said than done. We started dreaming about this in 2007 or so, and it wasn't until uh, Matt LeRae, my co-author on this talk and in, on, in a recent paper, uh, sort of developed the primers, figured out how to get high quality DNA, figured out the pipeline, the whole thing from beginning to end took about seven years to actually make happen. And I guess maybe it was a blessing in disguise because when we first started doing this work, we thought it was gonna cost $20,000 to analyze each of these structures and now it only costs $200. So not being able to do it right away maybe was a good thing. But in any case, it was, was not that easy to get to the point where you are now. Um, so this is, this is the, these are the kinds of samples that we have. Um, so you take one of these structures, you've got the plates, that's the Cecil community, you take a scraper and put it all in a blender. Uh, then you pull the small, the, the, the slightly larger things, greater than two millimeters, off the plates themselves. You see a crab and an abalone here, and a lot of the stuff falls into the contain, onto the floor of the container that the structure is sitting in as well. And so you take all the water from that container and pass it through a series of sieves, and so you get the stuff that's greater than two millimeters, which is conventionally barcoded, and then the stuff that's two millimeters to 500 microns, and 500 microns to 106 microns. And, that, and each of these three samples are then analyzed using next generation sequencing and, and metabarcoding. So here are some of the results. Actually, this is actually from an oyster reef um, uh, rather than a coral reef, although there are more coral reef samples that are in the process of being analyzed. But these were the first sets of samples. Coral reefs in uh, Virginia and Florida, I mean oyster reefs in Virginia and Florida um, deployed for, the structures were deployed for about six months. And they were deployed in the following array. So we had clusters of three, uh, three groups of three. So the clusters were about two millimeters apart uh, two meters apart, and then the, the, each of these clusters of three were separated by about 100 meters. And the total sample size is still pretty small. If you add up all the surface area of all those plates, it's about 7.8 uh, meters squared. Um, and mo this has all been recently published, so I'm not going to talk much about the, or at all about the methods. Uh, and Matt's here as well, so you should ask him about the methods, not me. Um, so uh, here are some of the results. First of all, here what the, this is what the plates look like. Uh, you can see right away that the uh, temperate habitat in Virginia is much less diverse than the subtropical habitat in Florida. And here are some of the basic statistics. So about a million sequences. This, it, the, things are changing so fast that it can say only a million sequences now, when of course five years ago you'd never say only a million sequences. Um, I think the, there are three, uh, three really important uh, numbers to think about. One is that despite the fact that this is our near two really well-studied places where there are marine labs, only about uh, less, less than 12% of the OTUs could be matched to genus and species in any database. So there's a huge scarcity of relevant sequences for marine invertebrates in these databases. And moreover, uh, anywhere between 28% and 40% couldn't even be identified to phylum. So it's, it's remarkable how little we have in the databases to draw on that help us with these samples. And then the other thing I thought was really interesting uh, was if you look at the larger things, the conventionally barcoded things, they only share about 4% between Florida and Virginia, which is sort of what I would have expected. But if you look at the metabarcoded community, it's actually 21% similar. And we'll, we'll get to that again a, a little bit later. Okay, so here are the diversity um, 
data uh, plotted explicitly. And again, the different, this is the, these are the different size classes for the stuff that falls off the plates, and this is the stuff that's attached to the plates. And you can see that the, the larger stuff, stuff greater than two millimeters that walks around, the sort of things you think about when you think about marine diversity, like crabs and shrimp and that snails, that sort of thing, is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, 38 OTUs compared to 100, uh, 1,200 OTUs in total, so in both places. Um, and uh, in fact, you can find about two-thirds of all the diversity in the fraction that's less than 500 microns in size. And then the other thing is that Florida is more diverse than Virginia, but perhaps not as more diverse as you might expect from conventional latitudinal analyses. And that's because these smaller fractions don't have as steep a diversity gradient as the uh, larger ones do. Um, this is a, several plots about showing the, the sim similarity across locations and across different, the different community types, the sessile and the two size, the two uh, metabarcoded uh, mobile fractions. And you can see really nicely how, how, you can see really clearly how nice these data behave. And this is, not everyone gets data quite as nice as this, I will say. You really, this, is, this work is still not sort of automatic pilot work. You really have to pay attention and know what you're doing to get this kind of really gorgeous data. So Virginia and Florida really well separated regardless of presence and ab versus presence absence analyses or relative abundance. And then the Cecil fraction is separated from the two millimeter to 500 micron fraction, which is separated from the 500 micron to 106 micron fractions. Really, really clear patterns. Uh, much clearer, actually, I have to say, than we expected to get. In terms of taxonomic composition, here you see it. Uh, 22 animal phyla, the most common one, not nematodes, because we probably don't have a lot of sediment in these, in these samples to support huge numbers of nematodes. Arthropods, as in a tropical forest, are the most diverse here. Uh, again, more sampling is needed, despite this is two years' work now. And um, what you see is that most of these curves are continuing to increase, uh, the only exception being that larger things that greater than two million, mill millimeter uh, animals that were analyzed with conventional barcoding in Virginia, the lower diversity site. That, that curve is leveling off, but the rest of them are still going up. What was really amazing was the extent to which the geography was so finely reflected in these samples. And so here you see um, uh, tr cluster, a clustering analysis. And what's, uh, the, the things that were two, mil two, meter, two meters apart were significantly more similar to each other than the things that were only a, were 100 meters apart. So even at the scale of two meters versus 100 meters, a lot of distinctiveness in these communities. And you particularly see this in Florida, where these circles are all, are the clusters of three adjacent samples for the different sample types, Cecil, uh, smaller and larger um, metabarcoded fraction. You see each one of them is clustered. It's statistically significant in Virginia as well, but in Florida it's really remarkable. And then finally, a number of talks uh, in the course of this session have talked about whether you can get abundance data. And by, by abundance here, I, I really mean biomass, because obviously you can't count or get counts of organisms, but you can't, can't, the question is, can you get a measure of biomass, which in some ways ecologically is more important than the numbers of individuals when individual sizes are so varying. And, um, and, the, and the data show that we get a remarkable amount of information about relative abundance of ecological significance. So here you see, this is, this was, this was a ground truthing test where half the sample, half the samples were uh, the individual organisms between um, 500 microns and two millimeters were picked out of the sample and, uh, and barcoded and the amount of DNA in each of those little tiny organisms was measured. And so you can look at the amount of DNA per OTU versus the number of reads. And what you see is a pretty, high, uh, a pretty good linear relationship. There's a lot of scatter, but it's not too bad. And overall, um, in terms of the ability to pick things up, anywhere between about 65% and over 90% of all the species that were in the sample, uh, we were p uh, w which were measured directly, we picked up with metabarcoding. And if you collapse this down to functional groups, something that I think Derek Tittensor would be interested in from a, from a, from on the basis of his talk yesterday, the, the relationship is remarkably strong. So this, this, this takes all the OTUs and 
clusters them by phylum, looking at the number of sequences per phylum versus the amount of DNA per phylum. It's really beautiful. I mean, just amazingly good relationship. And you get the same, we did the same thing calibrating abundance by percent cover for the Cecil community, and we got the same uh, good uh, measure about really the similar kinds of patterns. Okay, so this is, this is, gives you a sense of what you can do in terms of trying to get a handle what lives in the ocean. I wanna now uh, address directly the themes of this particular session, which was conservation, because of course this is not an abstract exercise. A paper was published earlier this year suggesting that um, although the sea is a little bit behind the land in terms of the, uh, the pace of industrialization, we're rapidly moving toward an ocean which is so heavily impacted that it's actually being impacted at the same scale as the land. And this is a really nice graphic that was put together by the New York Times to, to illustrate the main message of this paper. And uh, th the, that industrialization, of course, involves not only um, uh, overfishing and pollution, and habitat destruction, but also all the changes in the ocean that are taking place due to the amount of carbon dioxide that's being put in the atmosphere, a big chunk of which, about a third of which, is actually dissolving in the ocean and drastically changing the pH of the ocean in a way that when I was a graduate student back before all of, most of you guys were born, um, we never even talked about ocean acidification because it never occurred to even uh, ocean geochemists that we could possibly change the pH of the ocean. But here, here you see this little, uh, try, this is the last 25 million years, and the projection for the end of the century, this is pH, you know, around, uh, bouncing up between 8 and about 8.3, and then this precipitous drop down to 7.7, .7. and remember pH scales are logarithmic, so huge potential impacts on ocean biodiversity we're facing if we don't veer away from this business as usual scenario with respect to carbon dioxide emissions. And so to, to try to get a handle on what a future acidified world might be like, there are a number of ways you can do this, but one way is to take advantage of these very special places on the planet where carbon dioxide bubbles up through the seafloor and actually naturally acidifies the ocean. And so uh, in collaboration with uh, Caterina Fabricius of the Australian Institute of Marine Science, we put these um, structures out on the different parts of these. They look, looks like champagne, but it's actually carbon dioxide bubbling up. And so here are some very, very preliminary results from these analyses, because we're just analyzing these samples now. Here are the plates from uh, normal pH and low pH. You can see right away, rather different kind of community. And looking at the, lar the fraction that's the crabs and shrimps larger than two millimeters, see a drastic decrease in abundance from 284 to 114 individuals on three of these structures, and also almost a 50% drop in diversity in terms of number of OTUs. And then here's the metabarcoding data, which is actually really interesting because if you look at all the metabarcodes together, you see there's no difference between the, high, the normal pH and the low pH environment. But that's because the tiniest fraction, the organisms between 100 and 500 microns, are actually show, uh, if anything, more diversity in the low pH, but on the larger fractions and the sessile communities, you get sort of what we expected, which was a drop in diversity in low pH. And so it's conceivable that this very tiny fraction is much less sensitive to ocean acidification uh, than we had expected. This obviously requires uh, more data, but that's what it, the data that suggests to date. Okay, just a few more slides looking forward. Um, there are a number of ways we can do this better. Um, we can use more genes. All this was based on the uh, CO1 mini barcode, um, and you could obviously add different uh, genes to get, increase the uh, taxonomic uh, uh, coverage. But you could also sort of forget about PCR altogether and use a shotgun approach. And uh, this not only gets, completely gets away from PCR bias, um, which we don't see much evidence of, I have to suggest. That's what that abundance data tells you, not only that you can get ecological information out of it, but, but um, but that there's not a huge PCR bias, at least among the animal phyla. But you can also capture information about metabolic genes the way microbial ecologists currently do now and look at local adaptation. And then finally, there's this whole ability to sort of do this on a much bigger scale than we're doing this now. It's part of what uh, the Smithsonian's Marine Geo, uh, Tenenbaum Marine Observatory Network is about, and John Kress will be talking about that later, so I won't say any more. 
it could definitely be incorporated into this planetary um, biodiversity mission of Pauli Bear, which I think is a wonderful idea. We'll have to, to uh, cooperate on that basis. But in addition, uh, I'd like to think about, I'd like you to think about what some of the big questions are and challenges. Because we, up until now, and this is reflected in our work and in many of the talks, you, we've been struggling as a community just to make the damn thing work. But now it's working. So the, so the hard part is now not actually making it work. Now it's not to say that it's super easy and the bioinformatic challenges are still really substantial in some cases. But increasingly the hard part is actually gonna be figuring out what, what would be an interesting question to answer with this amazing, these amazingly powerful tools we have. That's actually the harder part. We can do almost anything, but we don't have the time and the money to do everything, so what are we actually gonna do? And so here, this is just a few ideas about things that we might want to think about. First of all, what are these really dark taxa, as uh, Rod Page uh, called them yesterday? Is, are they just things that people haven't released the sequences, or they're taxa that we um, just have never collected a barcode for? I think one of the messages of the high number of dark taxa in these data is that we, instead of focusing on trying to get at every last species, we really need to start thinking about the deep branches on the tree of life and making sure those are all really represented well. And that's a good thing to do in the ocean because the ocean has about uh, all but a handful of the phyla, animal phyla, for example, are found in the ocean. And there are almost no phyla that are only found on land. So most of the deep diversity is actually in the ocean, not in land. Land may have more species, but the deep diversity is in the sea. And to do that, we really need to systematically sample uh, in the, on these deep branches and make sure we have not all, all the classes and orders and families and, and, and genera of marine invertebrates are like families of birds in terms of the diversity and their, and their age. And so really need to do a better job at getting coverage. So how does this biodiversity scale geographically and does that scaling pattern um, vary as a function of taxonomic group or body size or uh, as a function of location or the tropics and the temperate zone different? What is the nature of rarity? I mean, what, what are those rare taxa? Are they rare everywhere or only rare in some places? Do we see evidence of biodiversity collapses as we go along gradients of human impacts, sort of along the lines of what we seem to be seeing with pH um, in Papua New Guinea? And how is biodiversity changing through time? Jonathan Coddington asked yeah, uh, two days ago, do we need to save those community DNA extractions? And I would argue absolutely, because there's no way you're going to be able to compare the data from today with analyses done on samples collected 20 years from now. The methods are going to be so different. If you don't have vouchers of communities as well as vouchers of individuals, you'll never be able to document uh, change through time, which, and we are living in a changing time. And of course, finally, we might actually have an answer to what lives in a sea or even in one particular bay. So thanks very much, and thank you also to the Smithsonian and the uh, uh, Sloan Foundation for supporting this work. Thank you.